Yeah, so thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here that this is a special place for me. And it was a really big part of me growing up and becoming a much better scientist and a, a different kind of scientist than I had envisioned when I started graduate school and, and even when I finished graduate school. And let's see, I wanna start this if I can move forward. What's going on here? Okay, I'll just tap it. With this uh, gratitude slide, because I do have a lot of gratitude and you know I've colored it a pretty obvious way, purple and gold. I still bleed purple and gold if you cut me the right way. And that's because of you know six years of graduate school here, 17 years working on campus six in this department with just great relationships, all kinds of learning and just connections beyond campus into the communities around here and the places. And there's just a lot to love about the Northwest and the special places and the people that are here and how they appreciate the natural resources that um, really define it. So that's something that I miss not being up here um, and, you know, I hope to get back more COVID times have kept me away a little bit. And yeah, this seminar series was one that really helped bring me into fisheries more and more that part of our climate impacts group research was to look at climate effects on fisheries in the Northwest and the work that I was doing, with Bob Francis and Stephen Hare and others around salmon. You know, that really got me excited about working here. But then the Bevan series itself had a whole lineup of terrific speakers on big topics and, you know, from all around the world to hear these perspectives on a regular basis. And then the reception after was always a great chance to meet people and talk to them and just get to know them better. So that really cultivated my interest here. And I think in the faculty here and thinking about me to work on this side of campus as well. So that was that was great. So this is a real pleasure to be here. And then for this talk, just a couple of people in particular, Jared Santora, who's in our lab, an ecosystem scientist, really trained as a seabird ecologist, um, has been talking to me a lot about the whale entanglement and Dungeness crab fishery. I'll share some highlights from that with you today. And it's actually not an area that I, I worked in beyond helping him tell that story in a recent journal article. And what I call team thiamine, which I'll finish this talk with talking about a pretty new research project that I have co-led with uh, a woman in our lab, Rachel Johnson, who is located at UC Davis. And this has become a really interesting and productive program that sort of came out of the blue and fits in the theme of this talk. So Rachel is great for a lot of the energy and enthusiasm and leadership she's brought to that. And yeah, more of the kind of maps that I like have been looking at, I guess, for 30 years. Um, here's one from this summer, the snapshot of sea surface temperature anomalies. So the deviations from 30 year average in the late 20th century compared to what was going on midsummer this year. And you just notice that there's a whole lot of the warm colors in the North Pacific, in the North Atlantic, especially. And it was uh, an extraordinary summer for how warm the global ocean was primarily because of how warm the, the high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere were. And there's a time series going back to the early 80s for the global average surface temperature. And you can see how that just been creeping up in the last six years or so have been especially high and sustained high temperatures. The uh, North Atlantic has had that same kind of trend toward warmer temperatures and sustained high. The North Pacific, um, you know, it really jumped up around 2014 and has mostly remained at near record warm levels. Now, that in itself is a pretty big deal because you know the North Pacific is the biggest Northern Ocean. We have all our fisheries that are conducted, ecosystems and you know, protected species. And in terms of the global climate situation, you see the blue colors in the tropics. So that's an indicator of La Nina. So La Nina historically has come with these long distance connections, you know, atmospheric scientists call it teleconnections that influence the wind, weather, and ocean current and temperature patterns far away. And one of the things that you see in the 20th century is La Nina periods come with the cold Northeast Pacific. That didn't happen in the last three years, really. It just sort of narrow areas of cool water very near the West Coast. 
for most of those last three years of La Nina. And that's pretty unusual. And something that has become really interesting to me and sort of troubling is the fact that a lot of our historical patterns haven't held up very well. And maybe we could talk about more examples of that. But here's a figure that I pulled out of the latest US national climate assessment. So every five years, our um, government has charged the American science enterprise, including science agencies, to generate an assessment of the state of climate science knowledge and the impacts and adaptation options for this country to deal with future climate change. So this is in its uh, draft state right now. If you're interested, you can review it and comment on it for another month. And a chapter that is dedicated to the oceans and marine ecosystems has uh, some of this text that, you know, from coral reefs to Arctic ecosystems, climate change is altering U.S. marine resources um, in terms of pace, magnitude, and extent. It's unprecedented over multiple millennia with very high confidence they make that statement. And, you know, reading these kind of reports, looking at what has been happening, you know, to me, thinking back on the work that we have been doing and others have been doing the past few decades is that the future really feels like it's coming faster than we expected, than certainly I expect and have expected in terms of the pace of these extreme events that have been so high impact in terms of what they're doing to our landscapes, what they're doing to the oceans, marine life, and fisheries, and communities that are tied into those. And a lot of these changes have been totally unpredictable, or not predicted, I should say. And they've kind of come out of nowhere. And that is another major challenge in our science and, and management and just resource industries. Along the West Coast and uh, the whole of Northeast Pacific, experience its warmest three years from 2014 to 2016, going back to the late 1800s when we have some records that we can confidently say that indeed 2014, 15, 16, that's record warming. And this is uh, an average of the sea surface temperature anomaly field for that period. You could see that it's, it's more focused along the coast. In fact, it's cool north of Hawaii, that little blue spot at the same time. That is a pattern that actually looked a lot like a, a PDO pattern, a really strong expression of the warm end of PDO. And the tropics, in this case, they were really warm during that three-year period. So that's sort of more in line with how you might expect to see the Pacific temperature field laid out if the historical patterns stayed um, pretty stable from what they were early in the century. But there was also some kind of interesting differences where, you know, you had contributions from PDO and El Nino and other patterns, but then other parts of this, especially the initiation of it, that a colleague here, Nick Bond, labeled the warm blob. And the warm blob label, that's a winner, right? That's stuck around. And people use that all the time now to talk about warm patches of the ocean. And it's gotten to be, you know, kind of difficult to deal with for me. It's like, well, what do you mean by warm blob? When, where, how? You want to talk the original warm blob? You want to talk about a different warm blob? But that's how things go. And then some of the ecosystem events that had come with these conditions, you know, here's one that has received a lot of attention was a record-breaking harmful algal bloom that developed off the West Coast and at times extended from Southeast Alaska to Santa Barbara. And it lasted all summer in 2015. That's the record warmest year on record. And it produced a toxin called demoic acid that got into marine food webs and it impacted marine mammals and seabirds and also shellfish. It didn't actually harm the shellfish, but it contaminated them. So if a marine mammal or some other vertebrate preyed upon one of these contaminated things, like us, if we ate them, we'd get sick and we could die. So it closed a number of fisheries, including clam fisheries on the West Coast here, and then crab fisheries along much of the West Coast. And that was a, a big deal in 20, late 2015, especially. And it persisted into the spring of 2016. And it turns out that <clears throat> it was related to other things that were going on that were pretty unprecedented. And here's one that our agency was grappling with and uh, West Coast fisheries were grappling with, and that was a spike in the entanglement of whales, mostly humpback whales, 
but also blue whales and gray whales and some unidentified whales. Uh, the humpback whales numbers are indicated with the, the blue bar and grays in the gray and the yellow for un unidentified. And you can see that the numbers really jumped up in 2015 and 2016. And the entanglements in 2015 were mostly kind of in the spring and summer, sort of coincident with the, the period of that harmful algal bloom. 2016, it was mostly in the spring and early summer. And sort of after the uh, harmful algal bloom, and a lot of the gear that was identifiable was traced back to the Dungeness crab fishery, which is a really important fishery on the West Coast, from Washington all the way down into Central California. And lots of small boats have been able to make a living on Dungeness crab fishery, uh, fishing in the last few decades when salmon fisheries have really tanked. The albacore fishery has really shifted in where it's prosecuted. And some of the you know other things that people balance their ear on just haven't been as productive. And actual landings in Central California were a lot lower in the 80s and 90s than they were in the early 2000s, you know, to recent years. So it was one that was really pretty stable, growing, robust looking in terms of the economic returns and the status of the crab population. So this spike in entanglements then led to a lot of scrambling, like what happened? How did it happen? And how can we like work around this and not lose this really important fishery? This is uh, where this story kind of developed that Jared Santora had led an article that was published two years ago in Nature Communications. And it had a lot of pieces to the puzzle that you know we ended up putting together. So the hypothesis was that, well, on the one hand, you had a long-term increase in whale numbers. Uh, humpback whales were at historic lows in the 60s and early 70s, and they've been increasing pretty substantially for the last few decades. So, you know, almost an order of magnitude increase in the number of humpback whales. Gray whales also increased in that time. And then the environment changed a lot. With this heat wave, it was mostly offshore, and it put a big squeeze on the area that was cold and productive into just the, the shelf waters where the crab fishery is carried out. And the crab fishery is typically in Central California, starts November 15th, and then was ended in end of June or July. Most of the fishing happening early in the season, a little bit further north, it would start a little bit later, kind of in the past. So you had this persistent squeezing of the cold productive habitat, and that impacted the food web that the whales were making a living in there were really low numbers of krill produced in those years. And typically when krill are abundant, they're concentrated along the shelf break and then canyon heads and the shelf is pretty narrow, California. And so there's a spatial separation between the whales and crab fishery. And typically the whales go south in the late fall and winter. They leave California waters sometime, you know, in October, November, December, especially the breeding adults. But what we started to see is that some whales were lingering at the beginning of that crab season, you know, into December, and then coming back earlier. And now the whales, instead of being out spatially segregated on the shelf breaks, they were feeding inshore in shallow water where the crab fishery takes place on anchovies. So this is a period when anchovies were actually not that abundant in California but they were locally concentrated in patches over the shelf. And then, so that was sort of the 2014, 15, 16 story every year that had those features and it actually is continuing today. What's different is that that harmful algal bloom in 2015 then contaminated shellfish, which the agencies were testing for. So they stopped the opener in the fall of 2015 and it, Crabs weren't determined to be safe to eat until the spring of 2016. And there was, of course, a lot of economic pressure from these fishing communities. Like, we need to make some money. The crabs are out there. Let us go fishing. And they did. They opened the fishery, like, right on top of the, the whales. And there were this big spike in entanglements. And that then really caused trouble 
in a broad community of people who are interested in different dimensions of the ocean, including environmental NGOs who were already alarmed at the spike in whale entanglements, writing letters and saying, look, don't catch whales in this fishery. <laughs> and the fishing groups were like, don't shut us down. It led to the development of a Dungeness Crab working group. And this was a state-led effort in California that was really an interesting kind of collaborative model to bring in the fishing community, to bring in the NGOs, and to connect them with scientific advisors in the state and in NOAA so that we could start having this shared information base about what is going on. How do we understand this spike? And then what can we do to clean up the fishery and reduce the risk to whales, but also keep fishing? And this sort of timeline, you know, it shows a number of things that happened. And, you know, they still hadn't really gotten too far by 2016 that, you know, they first started working on recommendations for cleaning up the gear and marking the gear really well, removing derelict gear, because, you know, that just wasn't a practice. And a lot of times when an entangled whale is spotted, you can't tell what kind of gear it's been tangled with. So that's changed a lot. Like now they have really good marking and they also have programs to remove derelict gear that just doesn't lay out there. Um, they trained a bunch of people to uh, in the fishing industry to help as first responders in trying to get out on the ocean, see where the whales were and what their condition was. Um, and then also to do the survey work. But in recent years, there've been a lot of delays in the opening and early closures that continue to have an impact. One of the things that did happen in 2020 was this formalized regulation around a risk assessment and mitigation program. And here, California's Department of Fish and Wildlife, working with a um, crab working group, has set up a real-time monitoring system to support in-season management. And it's been codified into regulations uh, for a couple of years now. And it looks at the forage and ocean conditions. It looks at whale distribution information. So they're doing overflights, they have boats on the water, and they've actually developed some um, habitat models for whales and using, and this has been extended to loggerhead sea turtles as well. So they have satellite tag information to get tracks of sea turtles. And they're really tracking the uh, fleet much better now. So in addition to having the gear all marked, a number of these boats have um, like an AIS so they can track where they are and develop good spatial information on effort. And all of this has greatly increased the information base that decisions are made on and they're making decisions around it you know, almost you know, monthly now. And one thing that this risk assessment and mitigation program has lacked is any consideration for the economic impacts on the fishery side. And you see that there have been a number of publications in just the last couple of years, including one this year, that starting to account for that. You know, how much is the impact in different ports on different sized vessels? And now the next step is like, how are we gonna deal with this? And try and balance those trade-offs. On the science side, it has really generated a lot of interest in special um, custom-tailored products that can inform these decisions. So just a couple of examples here is a time series in the top right of what we call the habitat compression index. And this is just tracking the spatial availability of that cold productive habitat along the coast. And that time series, sorry that I didn't make the Axis is very big, but it starts in 1980 here, ends in 19, or 2022, and you can see there's lots of variation and having you know, this low availability of cold water habitat where the, the whale is during the spike and entanglements. That's not new, that, you know, that happened in the early 90s for a sustained period. There's some years in the 80s that had this big squeeze on habitat, but what is new is both the abundance of whales and then also this impact on the food web. And I'll, I'll get to that later. So people in our agency are involved in developing something called the 
California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. And if you've never seen those reports, there's a lot of indicators <laughs> and, and something that, uh, you know, I see when I look at it, I was like, well, that's a lot of indicators. <laughs> and it's hard to sort through that for specific applications unless you've really trained yourself. So here, there's been an effort to like consolidate it and have it really targeted for this particular application. So that's been a nice advance. And um, yeah, and whale distribution models have been developed to help support this too. So there've been a whole bunch of different outcomes from this activity. And one of the first things was this best practices guide that is uh, shown here. I mentioned derelict gear recovery, the training of the fleet, new funding for research projects and pilot projects, and something that had also been really valuable is just new and better relationships between scientists, between the management agencies, the NGOs, and the fleet. And now that this has been happening for about seven years, there's been some turnover, and new people are coming, and some of the people who've been there for a long time have left, but it, uh, it's a really interesting model for trying to bring in people across this whole spectrum of stakeholders. So they're part of the solutions. There are still ongoing challenges. Here's a picture I pulled out of a newspaper article from last week. This season was again delayed because the whales were present in pretty big numbers in crab fishing areas in Central California. It's just uh, opened January 1st, 2023, and opened under a, like a half gear allocation. So 50% of the pots that they had, they're allowed to fish. Closures and delayed, uh, or early closures and delayed openings have been a feature of most of the last four years. The process itself, when the state moved it into CDFW as a regulation, They've sort of taken charge of the whole thing now. So they're making the recommendations, pitching them to the fishery and the working group and seeking their feedback, but they're no longer like at the bottom in sort of grassroots development of uh, those recommendations. And, you know, at this time, there's just sort of a lack of win-win opportunities so that there is a trade-off here. You're gonna protect the whales, you're gonna protect the fishery. Um, although I think the fishery, uh, understands people in the fishery understand that that is at risk. You know, if they catch too many whales and they cross guidelines that are established now, they could lose that fishery for a whole year. So they're really cognizant about the cost of going too far um, with risk of entanglement. So the second story, it, it turns out that the, there's some threads that pull them together, although they sound really different. It's this business of thiamine deficiency in Central Valley Chinook salmon. And what was noticed in January of 2020 was that a lot of fry, shortly after they hatched, right about the time they were putting them in the ponds outside of the, the rearing, area, rearing sheds, lots of them were swimming erratically, uh, unable to feed, dying at really high rates. And it was happening in multiple programs for multiple different run types. So in the Central Valley, we have fall run, late fall run, winter run, and spring run Chinook. The fish health people looked at this really closely, tested for diseases, couldn't find any kind of common factor. And somebody said, well, let's test for this thiamine deficiency. This is a, an issue that has happened in the Great Lakes. It's happened in the Baltic Sea with salmonids. And sure enough, they put these symptomatic fry in a thiamine water bath, and the next day they looked great. <laughs> they recovered, they started feeding, they swimming normally. And that's really definitive of a thiamine deficiency problem. There were also reports in some of the screw traps that are located just downstream of natural spawning areas that there were a lot of fry dead in those traps, really unusual numbers. So it looks like it happened to fish that were spawning in the wild as well in that period, but that's a lot harder to track. So what is this thiamine deficiency? Uh, it's something that's been documented around the, uh, the world, really, in a whole variety of animals, including people. And it boils down to this is a vitamin that we cannot make and that vertebrates can't make. They have to get it through their diet. And it's synthesized by 
uh, bacteria, algae, and some plants and fungi. And if you don't get it in your diet, it causes a whole host of problems because it's an important part of your metabolic processes and your neurological processes. So here's some thiamine deficient fry that were being reared and at the UC Davis facility where we were doing some experiments. And you can just see like spinning around erratically. It's really obvious. And then these fish that are symptomatic typically die within a couple of weeks. You know, they're not going to make it. And what they've seen in some places like the Great Lakes and in the Baltic is reproductive failures in years when it's really bad. Let's see. So this is January 2020, and we're starting to get calls in our lab. Hey, this they've identified this thiamine deficiency. Like, well, we don't know what that is. And in fact, our lab director had told me he heard a talk about this issue a couple of years before. He went to the NPAFC meeting in, I think it was, uh, I think it was in Tokyo. And he's and I asked him what, what was the highlight of the meeting. He said, "Oh, this guy talked about this, this vitamin problem that salmon can get from eating too much of one kind of prey." I, oh, I think that's what this is. So we started talking. We started making calls, and something that uh, you know was really valuable for me is I had this network of salmon people up here in the Northwest, in BC, in Alaska, that I reached out to. I started making a lot of calls. Hey, do you know about this? And who's working on this? And it, you know, nobody in Washington was working on it. British Columbia, David Welch, who is now a private consultant, he had just published a paper on it. And he had some connections that he directed me to. And it included some of the senior scientists that worked in the Great Lakes for a few decades, you know, starting the 1990s, all the way till their retirement, which just about the time I called them and woke them up out of their retirement. And it turned out that you know, they have been really valuable and we have found a bunch of partners in federal agencies, state agencies, um, and in some of the other universities around and labs and in the angling community, uh, the commercial fishery and sport fishery because of their interest in helping with this. And we've been able to get funding from the state of California to sustain and grow a really big project. And this is happening also in COVID times, which is actually a really you know great thing for my mental health. <laughs> but I started uh, making a bunch of friendships and we started having a lot of online meetings and it worked really well. We were able to, to make this work. And we now have this program that is uh, going into its fourth year that includes monitoring, investigating causes, developing treatments, assessing impacts, and then engaging with people that are affected by it and can help us and are really interested in the information. So as Daniel said, like reaching out to make this useful and, and also just make it better science and get more information because again in COVID times NOAA didn't go out and survey the ocean in 2020. <laughs> the fishing community did so they were collecting things for us and one of the really exciting things that continues now is the monitoring looking at the egg thiamine concentrations at a number of different populations and California has um, a much smaller number of hatcheries than in Washington I would like be blown to bits to try and do this in Washington state because the system is a hundred something places where they're growing fish. California, it's you know less than 10. And the big Chinook hatcheries in the Central Valley, there's really five, right? And there are a couple in the Klamath Basin. And then there's some steelhead programs on the Mad River and the Russian River that we've been working with. So we've been sampling all the different runs in California, you know, mostly Chinook, but more and more steelhead. And then there are coho in the Klamath Trinity Basin, the um, hatchery programs there where we've been getting samples. And this is uh, the first two years of our data. So 2020 and 2021. And we have been selecting 30 individuals from each program of each run type, looking at the like 10 grams, so a couple hundred eggs from each fish to assess What's the thiamine state? And then some of the fish that are untreated are going to studies on their performance and survival. So that little graphic there in the black, the white curve is a survival curve fit to some um, 
total egg thiamine on the x-axis and proportion of survivors within individual families on the y-axis. And these are from winter run. They're being reared at a conservation hatchery in the northern Sacramento Valley. So Livingston Stone National Fish Hatchery. And you can see this pretty steep drop, but also some variation around that curve that we, we drove um, fit through those points. We've tried a few different fits and it doesn't really affect what we're calling the critical levels of five nanomoles per gram at a 95% survival rate or about 2.9 for a 50% survival rate. And these numbers are comparable to what has been found for other Chinook stocks in the Great Lakes where they've done similar work, um, different for different species like lake trout, Atlantic salmon, and steelhead. And the way we've color coded it shows that, you know, sort of replete or healthy levels in the yellow, you know, above eight, there's some evidence that there's sublethal impacts at those sort of intermediate levels between five and eight. So the bulk of the populations have mostly been above that, but you can see, at least on the coast, especially in 2021, the coho populations in steelhead had quite a few individuals that were in that trouble zone, below five and even below three. And in the Central Valley, lots of fish are experiencing this thiamine deficiency. And we think that this is representative of what the naturally spawning populations are also experiencing. In part, those naturally spawning populations are hatchery dominated now. Um, and there's no evidence from like fishery recoveries that the wild stocks or the naturally spawning stocks are using the ocean differently than the hatchery stocks. But that could be true and, and we don't know it. And one last thing about these data that I'll point out is that there is some pattern that we have seen at least in these first two years and now the third year where the winter run have had it the worst. Uh, the winter run are the, the most endangered Chinook salmon population um, on the West Coast, I think, certainly in California. And it's just a single spawning population that has been limited to uh, habitat below Shasta Dam for about 80 years now. And our hypothesis for the cause is that we think it's because these fish have been eating mostly only anchovies starting in 2019. And in 2019, there were reports from the commercial fishery and sport fishery that, yeah, wow, all these fish are eating anchovies. And other anecdotal reports, well, you could actually see the flesh of the fish was pale compared to what's typically seen, especially early in the season, you know, bright red or orange fillets, fish that would, you know, typically be feeding on krill for the early part of the summer. And in 2020, we started working with the fleet to collect stomachs and some of that data I put here on the bottom of this graphic. So in 2020, we had 357 stomachs, 97% of the biomass in those stomachs was anchovies, crazy numbers. 2021 wasn't quite as bad, but still over 90%. And some krill, some squid, some juvenile rockfish. John Field, who was a former student here and now a scientist in our lab who is uh, leading the rockfish recruitment ecosystem survey, he mocked up this sort of comparison of diets of, of California Chinook from the 80s uh, compared to 2020 when it was that really extreme year. And you can just see, oh, things were different <laughs> in the 80s. And he and uh, Julie Thayer and some others had published a really nice historical look at the seasonal and sort of variable, variable patterns in Chinook salmon feeding off the central coast of California with some data from the 50s that was actually the most diverse. The 80s was still pretty diverse, but it had like a narrower collection of um, prey items. And then this 2019 to 22, just crazy narrow compared to what that was. And it turns out that anchovies, like some other copaeids and other forage fish, carry an enzyme called thiaminase. And thiaminase, destroys thiamine in the digestive tract of a predator that eats them. And within the anchovy itself, this enzyme is compartmentalized within their gut in a way that apparently is not reducing their thiamine uptake. And there's some hypotheses that it might actually help them scrub thiamine out of a thiamine poor environments that could be a competitive advantage for them, but it really a lot of mysteries about this enzyme and why it exists and, and how it works. Some ideas that it's part of a, a gut mi microbiome, but uh, a lot of unanswered questions about that part of it. So we 
seem to be bumping into questions about different dimensions of this project every, everywhere we go. And in terms of the ecosystem development and changes in recent years, I pulled this quote out of a State of the California Current report and says in California, you know, 2019 anchovy abundance from our surveys, the highest in recorded history, while many common forage fish were low, you know, scarce. And something that, again, getting back to the whale entanglement story, you see in California in recent years, just this really intense predation on anchovies by top predators like humpback whales, seabirds, sea lions, harbor seals, salmon, halibut, you know, every, every kind of herbivorous predator out there is making a living on anchovies. And our lab uh, and La Jolla group runs a coastwide coastal pelagic survey, both acoustic control survey, and they estimate the biomass of the dominant coastal pelagics. And you can see 2008, lots of sardines, very few anchovies. Get into 2012, 13, sardines dominated, but overall biomass going down, very few anchovies. The whale entanglement years, really 14 and 15, pretty small numbers of anchovies from their surveys and just started bumping up in 16 and 17 and then really explodes in 18, 19. And that's continued. This dominant biomass and scarcity of some of the other forage taxa and the spatial distribution is really interesting that in 2017, they found that um, anchovies were sort of dominant south of Monterey. That's the green circles that I've highlighted here in the map. 2018, you could see that the size of my oval expands. That's in part because the survey went farther south, <laughs> but also in part because there were just more anchovies closer to San Francisco that year. 2019, it's up to about Cape Mendocino, 2020, or actually Point Arena, and 2020 all the way to Cape Mendocino. And 2022 looked quite a bit like 2019. I don't have that figure, but I did see a preliminary analysis. If you think about where Central Valley Chinook typically are distributed along the ocean, it's really sort of Santa Barbara to the Oregon state line. Although it varies quite a bit. And there are California fish caught off of Oregon and Washington, even British Columbia in small numbers usually. 2019 was interesting because the fishery caught a lot of fish south of Monterey Bay, many more than is typical. And that's where those anchovies were really concentrated, especially early in the season. So there's been a lot of spatial overlap. And if I were to draw the Klamath stock ocean distribution, it's, it's sort of just shifted to the north by a few hundred kilometers. Lots of overlap, but also tendency to be further to the north. And the ecosystem survey that uh, John Fields Group does in the spring is really targeting the forage fish community and juvenile rockfish are a key component of that. This is a multi-dimensional uh, analysis of you know what that community structure looks like in 2019 20 and 21 is really kind of in this other space the anchovy space <laughs> that it's just not just that there are lots of anchovies but there's also a scarcity of these other really common taxa that are known to be at times important parts of the salmon diets and sardines have been really scarce during this period so there's a, this other mystery has played into this, and that's like, why are anchovies so abundant and sardines so scarce through this warm period? The conventional wisdom for the last 20 years or so, at least, has been that sardines do well when the California current is warm. Anchovies do well when it's cold. That has not really happened in the last 20 years, and it really didn't happen in the last five. In terms of the uh, nutritional aspects of these different prey items, you know, we look at these five sort of dominant salmon taxa and see that anchovies have really high thymidase activity, the highest of um, herring, krill, rockfish, or squid. And we've looked at actually a bunch of species now that I'm not showing here, but sardines, I kind of thought, well, maybe they'll be, they'll be like anchovies. They'll have you know, a lot of thymidase, but no, they're pretty low. And then for the good stuff, the thiamine, anchovies are really low. And 
krill are the highest. You see squid are kind of variable with some high and low values. Juvenile rockfish, you know, they're sort of intermediate. Herring, not so much. And then lipid content, that's another interesting one that people have looked at, especially in the Baltic Sea, where <clears throat> they see that Atlantic salmon um, thiamine deficiency has been correlated with a high lipid diet. Uh, when they eat sprat, especially young sprat, they're really high in lipids and really low in thiamine and high in thiaminase. So they're sort of the equivalent of what we see with the anchovies off the West Coast, at least in these samples. So yeah, anchovies look like it makes sense that they could be a problem if that's such a dominant part of their diets. And, you know, we're digging into salmon diets, you know, as much as we can, trying to use archival tissues, looking at the fatty acid profiles in the eggs and in the prey items, and try and make this stronger link between diet and thiamine condition. Something that we really lack is information about the winter diet of salmon, that there's no fishery. And we don't really have big surveys to go tell us about the state of the food web during that time of year either. So it's a sort of the black hole. And the fishery itself in California has gotten squeezed into narrower and narrow windows of space and time. So now it's mostly you know, midsummer activity. And um, yeah, engagement. It kind of has felt like this has been a lot of real-time science <laughs> that we're doing to inform the managers work with them around the needs for treatment. And now it's pretty common practice in California hatcheries to give thiamine boosters to spawning adults or to the um, eggs at uh, fertilization. We've worked really well with the fishing community. You know, their interest has been high and then especially important in 2020 when we didn't have boats on the water and they've been supplying us with lots of samples and we've uh, had really good experience with the salmon in the classroom effort that's being organized through UC Davis in their citizen science operation. And they're actually collecting data for us on fall run, that they're getting fall run eggs that are fertilized and then noting down any symptoms in these fish. And, and we have uh, subsamples of what they get that are sent back to our lab, uh, which is back in New York to tell us what the egg thiamine condition is. So the, the management responses for this one have really focused on those treatments where they can do them. And again, we start to see that, you know, there's regular treatment going on. And depending on life history type, if the adult spawners get to the hatchery and are holding for an extended period, they're being given thiamine injections. So it's like a vitamin booster that dramatically raises the egg thiamine concentration. So you want to have at least a few weeks for that to be fully absorbed. So the spring run and the winter run have that characteristic. For the fall run, you know, they're spawning soon after they arrive. So there's no time for that injection. What they're doing now is uh, thiamine bath treatments at fertilization. And people, uh, Kevin Quox was at CDF and W has been a, a really important player in that, leading it and experimenting on it and showing that, yeah, this can work and sort of teaching people who are interested in doing it, how to get it done. It's also contributed to increased urgency for actions to try and help winter run. Winter run, again, they're in really big trouble. They're under tremendous habitat stress in a good year. And we've had a lot of bad water years because of multi-year droughts that um, have dominated the climate since 2012. So they have this lack of cold water, and there are recovery plans that have sort of laid out, well, we need to get some other populations. We need to build a portfolio with these fish. So there's been work to remove barriers and get these fish up above barriers and a couple of tributaries, one called Battle Creek. Another one is uh, the McLeod River and uh, above Lake Shasta Dam. So above Lake Shasta Dam, there are these historic habitats where that uh, life history type evolved to take advantage of spring fed cold water. There's flat line year round. It's like 50 degree water coming out of the ground, at high volumes. And that's really what they need. And that's what they try to mimic with water releases from Shasta Dam. So this was really a drought emergency response, but it morphed into a drought and thiamine emergency response of the eggs were treated, 
they were then incubated up into the cloud. Some of the juveniles were caught in a trap just above Lake Shasta, then moved downstream, put back in the river, and we're going to see in a couple of years if any of those return. And you know, these two examples that I shared with you today, they're, they're just meant to be examples to sort of take you through some of the really pressing needs that have come with this big environmental extreme. And there have been a lot more that a number of you are engaged in or at least familiar with. Uh, if you look in Alaska, British Columbia, other parts of the West Coast, the North Atlantic, you know, Maine has been a hotspot for climate extremes and impacts on their fisheries. And in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, plenty of examples to choose from. You know, I saw this paper a few months ago, you know, looking at the figures, and like, wow, that's just so depressing. And what it shows is the time series for the global ocean heat content from a model simulation in red. Uh, the black line is an estimate from observations. And going forward, two different future scenarios, sort of the high-end emissions and one where there is really constrained emissions to try and reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and you know, put the brakes on global warming. And what you see, you know, where we are today, it's not very far along either one of those curves. And those two curves are really close together for the next couple of decades, you know, into the 2050s. So at least through my retirement, it looks like the world's oceans are going to accumulate a lot of heat. And it's going to change a lot more than what we've already seen. And, you know, this one here is a vertical cross section, sort of global mean from the surface down to depth. And, you know, most of the global warming that's happening on Earth is really ocean warming. Over 90% of the excess heat is going into the upper ocean. It's slowly being mixed and diffused to greater depths. You know, that's where all the action is in the ocean, right? That's where marine life is, productivity. So we're talking about a really different ocean that's headed our way. And, you know, what we've seen to date, it does give us some insights about where we're headed, but, you know, the no analog future is continuing it's not going to be some new normal right it's, we're not headed to a new normal in our lifetimes that's not going to happen so you know i think it's a blurry view and you know this is this is a really big challenge and something that i didn't mention but i think is, is important too is that it, you know the west coast california we have incredible capacity on the science side we have it you know um pretty good relationships with the fishery and NGO community and you know, people get along. It's kind of a best case scenario in a lot of dimension, the human dimensions of this set of fishery related issues. There's been a lot of work to understand the past. There's been a lot of work to make projections of the future. And here's something that came out last year. Um, a regional climate model was connected to three different future scenarios from three different global earth system models. They're all you know, equally good models and they have different outcomes. <laughs> you know, They all get warmer, but they have really different changes in the local wind field that drives coastal upwelling, which is this key factor in the seasonal productivity and the year-to-year uh, -year variation and also in the long-term trajectory for where this is headed. So, you know, the second model in GFEL, it shows, oh, the, the north wind is going to get stronger. There'll be more upwelling. This will put some of the brakes. It's like dynamic cooling. It's pumping up cold water, nutrient-rich water to work against this thermodynamic warming that's happening globally. You know, the heat just coming in from the top. This one from IPSL, very little change of winds. Then this one from the Hadley Center shows more of a dipole, like more wind off the northwest and less off the southwest. And it's not clear which one is right. <laughs> and, and maybe they're all gonna be right at some time, but these are for 30 year averages into the future compared to 30 years in the past. And this modeling system that was used included nutrients and primary production, dissolved oxygen to show, you know, how does this translate up and at least to the lower trophic levels? And it has pretty dramatically different outcomes. So that, you know, gives me pause like, ooh, going to be hard to make sense of where this is headed, you know, at the scale that people need information to make decisions, at least in terms of spatial specificity, temporal specificity, you know, the way we live our lives.
this is a figure that, you know, it's um, something that is really nice for conceptualizing the way people make decisions around fisheries and how that relates to some of the different processes that influence the environment and the climate. So you've got here in the largest time and space scale is global warming and these sort of basin scale modes of variability. There's the El Nino and Enso, and then the more seasonal variations as you come down and local kind of extremes, hurricanes and flooding way over here on the left. And you know, industry operations are also way over here on the left. And you know, that's where people live. <laughs> that's where people work. And that's how you know our lives are conducted is down in that lower left, right? And there is a lot happening there. And making the kind of forecasts that are needed to guide decisions with the specificity that people really demand to rely on those forecasts, it's not something that is that commonly done operationally. <laughs> you know, weather forecasts, there's a lot of value in looking at the forecast for the next five to 10 days, right? That helps a lot for our day-to-day -day planning. But we get out to a few seasons or a year into the future and the information value is really low. And something that we saw in the work that we did climate impacts group focusing on that issue is that almost nobody's using that information. They would like to, if there was a forecast that could really tell me how much water is gonna fall out of the sky in my watershed um, next year so I can plan for that. That would be really valuable, but just it's not in the cards right now. We just don't have the capacity to do that. And then making ecosystem forecasts, taking everything to another level, right? You just got all these other uncertainties and unknown connections that make the space of uncertainty much bigger. So how do we work in this realm then if we have really limited capacity for making these forecasts at the scales that are needed for decisions? And I think, you know, something that we see in that whale entanglement example and in lots of other examples now tied into sort of more dynamic management systems <clears throat> is doing a better job with describing what's happening now <laughs> and what the recent past has done, making shorter term forecasts and communicating it in a way that it connects with decisions, right? Having custom tailored products. And this is a place where there's a lot of work to do because it typically requires an ongoing relationship. So the buzzword, in uh, this community now is engagement, which is not just telling somebody <laughs> about something. It is having a conversation, a sustained conversation where you learn as much as the person you're trying to help learns. And I think, you know, there's a lot of value in that, but it's also hard. And yet that is one really important pathway, I think, to resilience, to some of these short-term activities that aren't just influenced by those extreme events in the low left corner. They're influenced by everything on that map, right? Where I live is not independent of global warming. It's not independent of this La Nina that is misbehaving by sending the jet stream at California when it's supposed to be pointed up here, right? And <laughs> that to me is, it's a really important thing to think about and to sort of break away from this idea that Global warming serves decisions out here on the right, but it doesn't serve here. And then protecting yourself against environmental risks and climate threats in the lower left isn't about the longer term because a lot of actions that we take to deal with the short term will lend us some resilience to the long term. And this sort of fits in with, you know, what I think of resilience through just building adaptive capacity and and this is uh, another thing that you see in the community of people working in this realm is just a lot of focus on adaptive capacity building. And <clears throat> you're going to hear a lot about this in the talks this quarter. So, you know, I'm not going to go any deeper into any part of the, these examples that are listed in this uh, left column. But there are some things, you know, like better monitoring data access and communication. You know, we can do that now and, and we can do a better job with that now. And we are doing a better job in a lot of places, but there's potential to do a lot more with the development of different observing platforms and information um, gathering and 
um, integration. And you know, on the fishery side, you see that there's there is a push toward more dynamic ocean management. It could be with permitting flexibility. It can be you know with these kind of time area closures that are informed by real time information. And you know a lot of other things. So that is really on the kind of human dimension side. And you know when I sent my abstract to Daniel, he said, "Oh yeah, we wrote this paper." Uh, John Moore and, and Daniel wrote that it was in science earlier this year, I guess last year. And you know they laid out some really nice ideas around natural systems and how adaptive capacity is such an important part of their ability to continue to evolve and respond to a changing environment. So that's where I'm going to leave this. And I thank you all for your time and interest and hope you have some questions. I see a question over here. So when you were looking at like, you know, the food chain with uh, the small anchovies or is that what they were? Anchovies? Anchovies, yes. Yeah. So when, you were, when they were looking at that, did you use like isotope data to determine that, like, you know, the timing data? So uh, the timing is being measured, you know, by some biochemists <laughs> that are really focusing on the indicators for that, right? And now you're taking me out of my realm, but it's it's not looking at uh, stable isotopes. Stable isotopes that are being um, analyzed from fish tissues are being used to try and reconstruct parts of the data that we don't have the direct information for. So salmon eye lenses is one place where Rachel Johnson and her collaborators have done some work to you know, look through time at habitat use and diet in fish and have shown that, oh, there's, there's definitely something there. And they published some interesting papers looking at the early life history and sort of use of floodplain habitats, looking at sulfur compounds. And I thought, well, let's see what those other layers are about 28 layers in a adult Chinook salmon islands from California, a three-year-old. So there are a bunch of layers. They haven't like got the clock pinned down on what those layers represent exactly, but they do have the life history of the fish and some hope that we're going to get information about the uh, kind of feeding trajectories the different stocks have and how they relate to the egg thiamine concentration data that we have. Yeah, um, based on the Santora paper and also the work of uh, Jamil Sam Tori. Um, you were you were talking about um, the crab vessels having uh, higher and higher like instances of having AIS on board. But I'm curious, do you know if that's a requirement by the state of California, or if you um, know if you have any ideas of how the state of California could um, incentivize AIS for tracking of the fishery? You know, I don't know if it's a requirement to have your effort information shared or if it's been voluntary and maybe somebody here does know the answer to that. There's a really great report by the Nature Conservancy that sort of looked back at the working group and the development of this ramp that probably has that information and that's that's online. Uh, I think I had it linked off of one of these slides, but if you Google Nature Conservancy California Crab Fishery, you'll see this really nice report that was recently published online. Yes. A lot of the future directions and projections and like drawing from them and the ones they're really selecting. So I was wondering, so after like you're in your state and research on on that specific um salmon vitamin deficiency chain, like what are some takeaways for uh I guess like future promotions of events for life or in our ecosystem, or if they're like quicker in responses, I guess, if they were to get more resources out of the thing. Uh, you know what? I didn't catch your question very well. <laughs> Could you restate it? Hmm. For the vitamin deficiency case that you worked on, um, on salmon, um, the thiamine one, uh, were there any like takeaways or more specific takeaways from that? Okay, so yeah, the question is. Is uh, you know are there some sort of specific takeaways from that thiamine 
experience and case study on future directions for research. Yeah, so there are a lot of unanswered questions and data gaps around this issue in um, the West Coast as a whole, and California specifically, even with the effort that we have started and are continuing. And part of it is on the production of thiamine itself in the ocean and in streams, that there's no good information base about spatial, temporal production of thiamine and availability. But that obviously could play a really big role in terms of the marine food web sensitivity uh, or marine life sensitivity to thiamine deficiency. You know, maybe it's not that the diet is scrubbing it out of these consumers, but it's just not available. So we have partnered with a chemist at Oregon State University to take water samples on some of the ecosystem surveys to start looking at these dissolved thiamine concentrations, but it's just like the first snapshot. There's a paper published a couple of years ago from a hydrographic survey off of Baja, California, where they showed that in that survey, the waters were pretty low on thiamine. And that's outside of the realm of salmon. You know, it's further south than they go. But that's the only data on the West Coast that's available in the literature. In streams, there's also an interest in knowing if there's natural production in the spawning areas and the early rearing areas that we know in the hatchery, if you put eggs in thiamine rich water, that they'll uptake some of that and it can boost thiamine levels and protect them against, you know, what they're mothers have given them, and that the fry, shortly after they emerge, they can absorb it, and it's thought that they can absorb it off their gills. So that's another treatment that has been used in the Great Lakes and in the Baltic and in California, and it can work to remedy those uh, symptoms. So that's a really interesting part of the story. And yeah, the winter diets, I think that's an important part for salmon to understand that. I think that, you know, there's this bigger question about the ecosystem response to this recent warm extremes and the, the lingering issue of habitat compression with the warm offshore waters sort of squeezing up against the colder nearshore waters. I did have this picture that I thought I'd show that just from this summer where we had really good upwelling in the spring of this winter and actually at spring of this year and even in the winter, we had a lot of north wind and upwelling off California, and that's part of this weather pattern that failed to deliver rain. So the blues are really cold water, good indication of recently uh, upwelled water along the coast. And then there was this period in July and August where the winds really quit, and you could see the warmer and sort of more blue water from offshore squeezing up against the coast, basically sloshing in and, and squeezing the productive areas. So why has this been so good for anchovies and not good for sardines? Really important question for, you know, really key part of the forage base. And, you know, there's not a big fishery for anchovy. There's really no fishery, directed fishery for anchovy outside of a small bait fishery off the West Coast. There would be a big sardine fishery if its biomass was where the anchovies are right now. So that's another interesting thing. It's like, huh, why aren't we fishing for anchovies? I don't, I don't know why that's the case, but um, that's a, you know, another big question that people are trying to make sense of. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, so I don't know much about the native crab fisheries, but what kind of gear is, uh, is like most affecting whales? Or what kind of gear are they most willing to Oh, so I'm sorry, I didn't show that, but they use big pots that are kind of like cylinders wrapped in wire. They have a door on the top and they're left on the bottom with some kind of stinky bait that is got a scent trail that attracts the crabs. They come in, they get caught, and these are attached by a rope to the surface and a float. So the gear that is then used, you know, it's a really intensive fishery when it's open. It's just sort of paving the West Coast inshore areas. There's just a lot of buoys in the water. So you just think about all these lines, vertical lines hanging in the water. And there are some other fisheries that use that kind of fixed, fixed gear anchored to the bottom, floating on the top, like lobster fishery in Southern California. I think there's pot fisheries for sable fish. So the crab fishery has been implicated in about half of the entanglements 
but there are a lot of entanglements that, that don't involve the crab fishery. And marking the gear is something that has been a really important step for helping solidify our understanding like, okay, how much of this problem is due to the crab fishery and how much is not? So that's just an important advance is just having it really well marked. Andre. Yeah, well, first thing, if it's been 30, give it 10 years and it will go away again. With Probably. <laughs> Yeah, and try to be give it and try to be take it away. Um, they like a saw you thing. Um, the two two points. One, the interesting thing about um, I'm not familiar with brain whales. I'm supposed to be doing the assessment. If I didn't have a bracket problem, that Daniel talked about. <laughs> um, we've had a year of unusual mortality event, but it doesn't sort of coincide with the bycatch which is sort of occurred well after, yeah. which was. It, it, it still puzzles me as to you know, what the population effects of some of these these this bycatch is actually happening. It doesn't look like it's driving the actual dynamics of some of these bigger populations. So my main question is: you have, right on the end, you had the word flexibility. You work for an agency, right? Flexibility we tend to think of as fishermen need to be more flexible. Is there any sense that agencies are thinking about flexibility? Because everything I see is that our response to flexibility is to come up with a management plan that describes flexibility and has a work plan to develop flexibility, but doesn't actually do anything. So when will the agency be flexible? Yeah, so, you know, I'm in the Science Center. <laughs> <laughs> and... My I am just, I am, you know, a step away from that. And I, I think that you spend a lot of time in council meetings where discussions about policy, implementation of policies is the business at hand. And I know, you know, in Pacific Council, they recently under, underwent this scenario planning exercise to try and look at the threats posed by climate change to many different fisheries, which was a, a big lift, right, to, to go through all the different fisheries that they considered. So, yeah, I mean, my hope is that you start to see, oh, here are some policy barriers to dealing with the uncertainties that we're faced with. I think, it, yeah, it's probably mostly going to be a long, drawn-out process to try and introduce flexibility into many policies. But crises often drive rapid change in times when, you know, maybe go decades where there's just no change. And it, certainly you see water policy in California. A good example is unmanaged groundwater for the history of the state of California up until 2020. They passed a new law in 2020 to manage groundwater for the first time in conjunction with surface water, even though really good science shows that those are connected, <laughs> some really connected and some you know more distantly connected. But it took multi-year droughts and a serious crisis to get stakeholders and politicians to like, oh yeah, let's pull, pull the trigger on this is a hard one because a lot of the ag community has pumped groundwater to get through droughts. And they've just been pumping deeper and deeper and deeper. So the cost is going through the roof. So there are a bunch of factors that made it more likely to have some flexibility there, new policies. And I think, you know, we're going to see things like that with floodplain management, trying to recharge aquifers. Um, and then on the fishery side, you know, when you get a situation like this Dungeness crab fishery, they see the fishery at risk. There's going to be a lot of momentum to do something to keep it alive. To give us some way to make a living in it, I, I'm hoping. Yeah. A bit of a related comment. I think the science community had a lot of a big role to play in this because, you know, it's still stunning how many grant proposals and papers you read that say we will study this new detail that will lead to better forecasts about the future. So it's this expectation within the science community that we can be making better forecasts of the future and that's the basis of good management so I, i'm actually more optimistic than you but i think some of it actually comes from the science community itself yeah yeah and then and it definitely it, it sort of is an answer that people would love to get from us is that oh yeah we can do a better job predicting the future give us money and we'll go do the study and give it back to you and it, like now when i see grant proposals or research articles that have we're doing better forecasts to improve management. Like, really? Where? <laughs> How? 
tell me about it because I would like to see some examples where that has played out. And I don't, I don't actually know of examples in fisheries where that has really played out in a meaningful way. Way in the back, I see. So was that about the thiamine deficiency affecting whales? Yeah. Yeah. So something that um, I have been asking around a lot the last three years is: Does anybody see evidence for impacts of thiamine deficiency on other top predators in the California current system? That you know, I look off the bluff around our lab and watch humpback whales lunge feeding on anchovies and just eating tons, literally tons of anchovies year round when they're around. And their diet looks to be really heavy on them. Seabirds, same thing, pelicans, common murs. They're hitting the anchovies really hard. And in the breeding colonies that have been studied pretty closely on Año Nuevo and Farallon Islands, which are in the Gulf of the Farallons close by, they are documenting what the adults are bringing back to the chicks after they hatch. And they're like bringing them anchovies in these years. It's so dominant. So you would think that these other predators would be suffering. And no one working in those areas has told me that they see evidence of thiamine deficiency. So it's a really good question that I don't have an answer other than no, there are no reports of it on the Pacific coast that I've heard. There are some papers from the North Atlantic and the Baltic that do see thiamine deficiency in some seabirds <laughs> and in shellfish, but uh, there's no reports of it outside of California salmon right now. Although I did, I must say, I did get a, an email last week from a hatchery manager, uh, the Winthrop Hatchery, where they're rearing steelhead and they looked at 10 different families this year and found thiamine deficiency in those uh, pretty prevalent in those steelhead, which is really interesting because those steelhead, as far as is understood, are not hanging out in the California current where the anchovies are abundant. They're probably out in the subarctic North Pacific for two years, uh, Gulf Alaska, around the Aleutians. So maybe there's something else going on in other parts of the ocean too. So, yeah, I heard anchovy abundance has been high in recent years in the Salish Sea. And I think that, you know, if you had resident. Salmonids that just stayed in the Salish Sea and they were really having a diet dominated by anchovies. Maybe this is something you start to see. And certainly there are some populations and, and actually some hatchery programs that have been designed to create fish that stay in the Salish Sea so they can be caught year round, like the winter Chinook or blackmouth fishery. Haven't heard of any issues up here um, outside of that one example. Uh, but yeah, if it, if it is the dominant forage item, why wouldn't it be a problem? Unless there's something about these fish in the California current having especially high levels of this enzyme that isn't true everywhere we look. And we just don't have data right now to know if that's the case, if you should expect to see a lot of this enzyme.